All right, another very short chapter to go over. Uh, quality assurance, um, short but important. Uh, you should know that every um, accredited laboratory has to have in place a quality assurance program. Um, so that's why this becomes important. Accredited laboratories are those that can receive insurance and Medicare reimbursement for their exams. So that's that's kind of uh, it's a money maker. All right. So quality assurance uh, basically is what is used to validate the consistency of ultrasound images. It doesn't say that they're good images or bad images. It's saying that they're consistent from uh, one month to the next. Uh, quality insurance programs must be done routinely and periodically, and it is absolutely the responsibility of the sonographer to make sure that quality assurance is done correctly. Um, the Having said that, most sites, most places hire um, maintenance people to do the quality assurance. So if you have a maintenance contract on your machines, they'll come in and do the quality assurance for you. And that ha they're the ones that would then do it, but you are still responsible. Um, so the requirements of uh, quality assurance is that you assess the ultrasound uh, system components, um, that repairs are done promptly as needed, and that preventative maintenance is taken care of. And you must keep a record of this. The goals of it are to make sure that you have proper operation of the system, uh, to minimize the downtime of the system, detect probably the most important thing is to detect gradual changes over time. So if the machine <coughs> starts producing different pictures in March than it did the previous August, you will be able to detect that and demonstrate that the quality of the machines are changing. Um, the ideas are that you're going to reduce the number of non-diagnostic exams that you make and reduce the number of repeat exams, though I think that's probably more true for x-ray quality assurance than it is for ultrasound. The uh, type of devices that we're going to use in any quality assurance program include tissue equivalent phantoms, uh, Doppler phantoms, and beam thickness or profile phantoms. Um, of these three listed here, there uh, I'll just say that very few quality assurance programs look at the beam profile. Um, and you guys already know how to do this using a rubber band and an angle iron because we did this in the lab. So you could potentially make your own slice thickness phantom. Um, and also the Doppler phantoms, there are no approved Doppler phantoms on the market yet. They all have some problems with them, so there are no approved Doppler phantoms, though there are some that are useful, and we'll talk about their limitations and why they're not approved later. Um, the methods that are used are the, is that you test under known defined conditions, you test regularly, <coughs> the um, you utilize the same equipment settings each time and you utilize a phantom with measurable characteristics and um, you make an image in the identical environment. So you know, you're going to have to set your lights at the same level every time you do um, quality testing. You're going to have to utilize a phantom that is certified. You're going to need to make sure that everything that you're doing is set up the way you did it last time in order to see if there's any gradual changes. So that's all that means. So objective versus subjective standards. Um, objective are things that we can measure. They're factual, repeatable, and countable. And so the uh, let's use an example here that uh, a recent election in the United States, the count of the ballots is objective. There's a number of ballots that went for one candidate and a number that went for the other. That's an objective measure. Uh, subjective standards are, well, those ballots were legal or illegal. Well, those are subjective standards. And those have to be 
influenced by experience uh, and if they are affected by a belief or an assumption that somebody's making and they may vary from person to person so that's a subjective statement um, but they are based on reality so we we do know that um, a person's perspective uh, bases a you know subjective statements can be based on a person's perspective on things so if I look at your spleen and I see that it goes down and covers more than half of your kidney um, I know from my subjective um, evaluation of you know hundreds and hundreds of kidneys and spleens that that's an enlarged spleen and I need to make a measurement of it that demonstrates that. So if the spleen goes down and covers more than half the kidney, it's enlarged, and there's a problem. Um, but not everybody has that experience to know that. So subjective, a lot of it's based on what we know. Um, but however, it's not necessarily measurable. So the fact that the spleen goes over half the kidney, I'm not measuring anything, I'm just looking at it and making a subjective statement about it. Quality assurance needs to be based on objective standards. It needs to be based on measurements that are free from personal or biased perceptions. So to do that we use a tissue equivalent phantom which will have features very similar to um, to soft tissue. wonder why that is. Okay, we'll put in like features like soft tissue. This helps us evaluate the grayscale, gives us a tissue, a tissue texture, a focus, and it gives us a consistent speed of sound at 1540 meters per second. Um, M should be not capitalized. Um, it has a consistent attenuation. Usually this is either 0.5 or 0.7 uh, decibels per centimeter megahertz. Has definite scattering characteristics and definite echogenicity. It's very consistent in all of these. The grayscale is able to be evaluated as the phantom contains many small scatterers which look like soft tissue. These are usually made of graphite and added to the texture to add texture. The structures include um, anechoic areas, hypoechoic areas and hyperechoic areas so that we can evaluate not only spatial resolution but contrast resolution also. Um, the nylon strings that are used to show um, for spatial uh, resolution are also good point reflectors uh, that can be used for measurements that require point reflectors. So Doppler phantoms um, they're designed to measure the flow of fluids. Um, they do require a specialized fluid. I've got some in the closet. That stuff costs um, just over a hundred dollars per gallon. So it's not very cheap fluid. Though uh, the stuff I have expired in something like 2010 or 12, um, it still works fine. So I'm not going to replace it at that cost. Um, the flow phantoms uh, generally are used to measure the circulation. There's three types. There's fluid flow phantoms, string phantoms, and moving belts. Um, of these, uh, it is a well-known artifact that string phantoms cause blooming the blooming artifact when used or color bleeding artifact. A slice thickness phantom is used to evaluate elevational resolution. It's just like the rubber band on the angle iron that we utilized in um, our lab. The only difference is that it is it's more um, consistent than what we used in the lab. Uh, 
the commercial ones are very expensive so I haven't pick, picked up one of those yet um, so uh, and as it says here traditional phantoms are not able to measure slice thickness well yeah that's absolutely true anyhow these are used you measure it exactly like we did in the lab you measure across the 45 degree angle and the measurement from top to bottom is what provides you with the thickness of the um, slice. So we have some performance measures that we're able to make with our phantoms. One is called sensitivity and this is the ability of the system to display low-level echoes. Uh, when it's normal then we're able to see all the pin solid masses and cystic structures displayed on our phantoms. Um, the output power time gain compensation and overall amplification need to be adjusted to establish whatever the normal sensitivity is for that machine and then all subsequent quality assurance measurements are made with the settings at the same location um, to determine maximum sensitivity the output level and amplification is set to and i'm going to quote this from the edelman book Okay, output power amplification is set to maximum practical levels. Um, depth of tissue like uh, texture is measured to determine maximum sensitivity, and this should not vary from one routine evaluation to the next. So that's out of the Edelman book. Um, but what happens if you do that is if you turn up the output power and amplification to the maximum practical levels, everything in your tissue phantom will be shown uh, you will see uh, good tissue all the way through it, throughout the phantom, um, with no no um, minimum areas at all. And this will not vary because it's up too high and you're overgaining and over amplifying uh, your image. And so, yeah, you'll never notice the difference. Um, the alternate measure is what you should be doing and this is where the system is adjusted from uh, very minimal brightness to full brightness and you check where those settings occur at and the maximum sensitivity if you turn down the gain until you start losing um, pixels in the lower portion of your image so that um, you're unable to see the actual uh, structures of the image. Um, in that situation you've turned down your gain and that is where you want to measure it at from time to time periodically and that should be that should be able to vary then from one evaluation to another if there's a decrease uh, diminution of, of output um, output uh, sensitivity. All right, there's something called the dead zone on our machines, and this is up at the top near the transducer. Usually there's some reverberation artifact where you cannot see um, pins in the very, very near field. Um, though I will say uh, with older machines, this was absolutely true with the Accusons of the 1980s and uh, early 90s. This was true. We did see absolutely a dead zone on all machines. With the newer machines, we're not seeing this dead zone at all. And that is because the newer machines are using different piezoelectric materials. They're not using PZT anymore. They're using polymers. And we're just simply not seeing the reverberation artifact in the near field that we used to. And so, uh, calling something the dead zone is almost a misnomer. Uh, I haven't seen a transducer really since 2000 that had a problem seeing the the nearest pin of the dead zone, the one millimeter pin. And certainly as you go up in frequency you see less and less dead zone. Uh, than with low frequency transducers. But again, even your lowest frequency transducer on something made in the 19, in the 2000s, excuse me, will not really show you much of a dead zone at all. If you do need to image in an area, 
near the face of the transducer, uh, what you do is you use a standoff pad in order to move the transducer back a little bit and provide yourself some distance to those first reflectors. Um, this also allows the focus to come into play um, because on many machines the closest to the transducer you can get the focus may be one centimeter or so. And if you're looking at a structure at a quarter centimeter, then that's simply too deep of a focus. If your dead zone suddenly increases in depth, then it may indicate a cracked crystal, um, detached um, matching layer or backing layer or a longer pulse duration. Something has happened to the machine to cause a longer pulse duration. We want to measure what we call registration accuracy. This is the accuracy of our calipers. So you would go in and you would um, put your calipers over the pins and see that they are the correct distance apart. Most um, phantoms have pins that are two centimeters apart. So you just simply put your, trans your, your calipers over say three pins so that tells you that they should be exactly six centimeters apart you look at the measurement output if it says six centimeters then everything is good if it says something different then you have to investigate why it's different you can evaluate the focal zone um, by looking at the depth of the narrowest beam width and this is um, useful but uh, we did this in the lab when we were looking at lateral resolution and we found that in many cases with our phantoms and our newer machines it is very difficult to see any uh, significant focal zone difference from the top to the bottom. However, it was much more dramatic on the older machines when we hooked those up and ran them. To measure axial resolution, um, you simply look at the pins. The smallest pins that you can definitely separate apart tells you your axial resolution, and then you just pick up the manual that tells you how far apart those pins are, and that's your axial resolution. With lateral resolution, we do the same thing, but we do it side to side. Um, so you would look at this and you would say, okay, well, the first point where I can see side to side with my um, lateral resolution is between is right in here and you'd go look up in the book and find out how far apart these pins are. Now there's something called compensation uniformity and this is the ability of the system to display reflectors of uh, similar reflectors with equal brightness and so when we do this if the um, if we set the TGC's to a certain level then reflectors of the same material should have the same appearance regardless of their depth so if you look at the tissue like material in here it looks homogeneous from top to bottom and so we can say yes that looks identical from top to bottom and so this uh, uniformity is good on this one. We also have mock cysts and solid masses on our uh, phantoms. You can see some cysts of varying sizes here on the left and some masses of various echogenicities on the right. Um, So you can look at those and see uh, if the textures are good or if there's something wrong with your cystic structures. Generally all you have to do is take one picture and then just compare it to the one you took six months before to see if there's been any changes. <coughs> so we um, want to make sure that our displays are good and so we always want to make sure that if we once we complete our picture that we adjust the um, display to match up on multiple devices 
such as the remote viewing stations, and so it looks the same in our scan room as we do in the remote areas. And we do that with something called a SMPTE test pattern. And the SMPTE test pattern was made by the Society of Motion Picture Test Engineers, and this provides a standard used to determine the contrast, brightness, and uh, resolution of displays. And most of our machines, there's a way to pull up a SMPTE test pattern, and then you just look at it on the display, and you see you know, how faint of a line you can see that's how narrow together it is, and you check that to what you saw um, six months ago, and that tells you if there's been any changes. So that concludes our um, contrast imaging, or quality assurance, excuse me, uh, lecture, and so I'm going to end it there, and have a nice day.